So let me quickly check if everybody can hear us. Uh, we are <laughs> about to begin the webinar. We're waiting for a few more people. As you see, people are coming inside the, the room, and so to say. So we'll wait another maybe two or three minutes so that everybody gets in and we're then we're ready to start. All the speakers are there uh, and we're happy that you all arrive as well. Thank you. Okay, I guess uh, people are still coming in, but uh, let me maybe open uh, the, the seminar because we want to make all the best use of the little time that we have uh, with our excellent panel and with so many people joining from all corners of the globe. So good evening, good morning, Good afternoon, uh, wherever you are, whatever time it is, it is high time that we have this conversation that has been organized for us by the Transnational Institute and the Asia Europe People's Forum uh, a discussion or, or a conversation about the situation in Afghanistan, which has been uh, catapulted back into the headlines the past weeks after it, it had been largely forgotten or relegated to the back pages for many and many too many years uh, during the ongoing war intervention occupation, call it the way you want, and we will hear more about it uh, later. The whole evacuation, the, the drawback, the agreement that President Trump made with the Taliban and then the, the, the troops from NATO leaving Afghanistan, it has been a very uh, chaotic, uh, badly planned, uh, but a predictable end to a war and an intervention that was pretty much doomed from the beginning to end the way it seems to be doing which is a sad thing to say, uh, because that means that the Afghan people, uh, men, women, children, uh, farmers and countrymen and, and uh, citizens, that they are all suffering the consequences of an intervention that, uh, that was probably never uh, really about the Afghan people and their security or their human security, but had many more reasons behind it. And we will be looking into those uh, today, but we will also try to look forward and to see what can be done. Uh, and not just by the powers that rule the world, but by civil society organizations, by people like you and me, by movements, organizations all over the world. So. Uh, before I will introduce the panel and start uh, the debate for this uh, for this afternoon, I'm sitting in Belgium, so it's afternoon for me. Um, <clears throat> let me just quickly say that we will try to reserve at least 15 minutes by the end of the webinar to answer some of your questions. If you have questions, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen uh, where you can put questions all the other remarks, hello to anybody or additional information that you think should be shared is uh, very welcome in the chat box. But real questions for the panel, please reserve them for the Q&A box. 
the people from TNI and the Asia Europe Forum will uh, look at that and will make a selection and bring it back to the panel by the end of the webinar. Voilà. I'm Guy Goris. I'm a journalist from Belgium. I've been working on the issue of Afghanistan and the broader region for 15 or 25 years. Uh, and I'm absolutely honored to be playing the host today to such an excellent and exquisite panel. The panel that we have, let me quickly introduce them to you, is uh, first Sahar Saba. Sahar is a uh, women's activist, women rights activist from Afghanistan, uh, and used to be very active with the uh, Rawa, the Revolutionary Afghan Women's Association, and a, a, a movement that has been active for a couple of decades already, fighting for the rights of uh, Afghan women. There we have uh, Afrasyab Katak. Afrasyab is a former senator uh, from Pakistan and also the former chairperson of the Pakistan Human Rights Commission. He was born in uh, the Kohat district of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in uh, Pakistan. And for those of you who don't know, that is a region bordering Afghanistan. So <clears throat> he uh, was almost born to be involved in the Afghanistan conflicts and, and politics over the years, and he has uh, followed them from very closely. Third, we have uh, Achin Vanaik. Achin is Emeritus Professor of International Relations and former head of department of political science at the University of Delhi. He is a lifelong activist for, among others, nuclear disarmament. He has authored, edited, and contributed to so many books that we can't even start to name them, but they treat both India's political economy, uh, communalism and secularism, but also contemporary politics and nuclear disarmament. Then we have uh, from the same city of Delhi, Anuradha Chinoy, Anuradha is former Dean and Professor Emeritus at the School of International Studies at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi for the friends we say GNU. Uh, <clears throat> she has published authoritative books on human security, geopolitical impact of the rise of BRICS, but also on militarism and women in South Asia. And then finally, we have uh, Curry Peterson Smith. Curry is a fellow at Washington-based Institute for Policy Studies, and he researches US empire, borders, migration, war on terror, and his uh, dissertation focused on militarization and sovereignty. So he's well-placed to give us a look from Washington uh, or his look from Washington, not the look, uh, because there are many and his won't necessarily be the one from uh, the White House or from uh, the Capitol. Voila, these uh, are the people that will be informing you. Thank you very much, all five of you, for taking time out for this important conversation. So the first question that I wanted to bring uh, to, these, uh, to these speakers is uh, a very quick one, uh, just to put us in the mood and, and to bring us update, uh, but not just to give the news, but also to highlight what the news is telling us. And so the question is, what has been happening? Which developments have you seen over the past hours, days, or maybe week that you think is really important to understand and to highlight? Um, maybe one or two things, and then we will have a quick, uh, let's say, a canvas on which to work on to get deeper into the situation. Sahar, can you give us your quick view on what is happening at this moment in, uh, in Afghanistan that we should really know and keep in our minds? Uh, thank you for this opportunity. And it's really important, as you said, the voice of Afghan people should be heard in this critical situation. Uh, it's a catastrophe, it's a tragedy that's happening in Afghanistan and everyone knows. Uh, I'm personally very much uh, concerned and emotional uh, for the last uh, um, almost two weeks, but even now, because the news and the stories and the experiences that we get from Afghanistan are disturbing, are heartbreaking and 
it's impossible to really uh, uh, describe them in words. So it's uh, not just about uh, the evacuation, which is which happened, and uh, we now see it's also ending. Uh, it's not just that because what we saw uh, lately in the media, all focus shifted to the evacuation, which also is a very important uh, thing that uh, should be done. And this is what Afghan people, especially those in danger, uh, civil rights uh, activists and human rights and women, and we know all those who have been against uh, the Taliban and against this whole process, against the occupation. So it's really important that should not be ignored. But at the same time, uh, the media, the political uh, concerned parties or anyone who is interested in Afghanistan should also uh, turn their attention to the great human uh, tragedy crisis that's happening in Afghanistan. And if I personally tell you, because I'm daily on daily basis in contact with Afghanistan, not only with my family, but through them with many um, others uh, who are uh, in the verge of humanitarian crisis. People don't have food, people don't have access to very basic uh, facilities. And this is uh, uh, totally, uh, or at least to a lot of extent forgotten uh, and every focus is on the evacuation of first of all of the the foreigners of the western uh, people and then of course those uh, who are in danger so this is really one of the important uh, things that should be highlighted in afghanistan yep. but also to listen to the uh, and to hear afghan people to listen what they want not just what we hear from the taliban and how they are trying to uh, use their political tactics or I don't know, to show a different uh, image. And we all know that um, that's only to attract uh, attention, that's only to attract support. And we all know that they are the same um, uh, brutal anti-women, misogynist and religiously uh, extremist people who uh, will um, victimize Afghan people and most importantly women and uh, those who are against. So it's really important to highlight. Then it's also important to uh, really uh, talk about the um, not only the consequences of this last uh, 20 years of this occupation, as you said, and I fully agree that it, it was not intervention, it was not anything humanitarian or for the women of Afghanistan or for their freedom. It was an occupation. No one wanted them to uh, come to Afghanistan. Uh, and they occupied our country and they now leave so uh, with a lot of embarrassment and shame and spending billions of dollars and um, many human uh, casualties and a lot of other things. So they should be really uh, taken accountable for this. Yeah. They should I yeah. Let, yeah, let, let's take that further in, in, the, in the discussion. I, what I take from, from your first uh, remarks is, first of all, there is a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. We should not forget. Second, we should listen to the Afghan people. And third, and we will develop that further, the, the intervention was an occupation and people should be held accountable. But we will return to that part uh, further in this uh, webinar. Afrishab, uh, we would like to hear from you what you have been seeing the past days that you think is crucial to remember and to understand. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank you and the organizers of this uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to open my remarks uh, by saying that actually uh, this so-called end game in the war of terror uh, is basically uh, the beginning of a new Cold War in our region. U.S. Uh, is sort of uh, out, U.S. and its European allies in NATO are out to contain China. And that's why I believe uh, Taliban's have been uh, re-inducted in Afghanistan from their bases in Pakistan. Uh, Taliban's are uh, refugee children uh, educated in religious seminaries, 36,000 religious seminaries in Pakistan. 
uh, they are brainwashed by extremist ideologies of Wahhabism, Salafism, Takfirism, Deobandism, etc. So uh, they, they, they have been inducted. It's, it's like a permanent uh, IRA without Shen Fen. Uh, they, 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 they believe in gun. They have uh, occupied Afghanistan again without uh, any uh, social contact. Uh, they, their governance is not based on any social contact. Gun is their social contact, violence. Uh, is their social contract. So uh, it's really very bad for Afghan people. Uh, yeah, they, they, there was American occupation, and now there is Taliban occupation. It's also literally occupation, although Taliban nominally uh, claim to belong to Afghanistan. Uh, there are seven or eight countries in close contact with Taliban, it's starting from Pakistan, US, US UK, uh, Russia, China, Iran, Qatar, and Turkey, almost eight countries, very close contact. Now, all of them have different agendas. So everybody wants to use Taliban for their own purposes. The West would like to use them to contain Belt and Road Initiative of China. China would uh, like to depend on Pakistan for including Taliban into its uh, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, particularly uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, Russia and Iran will team up to uh, repeat what they did in Syria and the Middle East. Uh, Turkey, of course, wants to uh, have its presence uh, in Central Asia, where Turkic population uh, abounds. I mean, there are many uh, states uh, populated by Turks. So, so see, this, this, uh, all, all of them have jumped into the fray, and uh, no one knows what will happen. But as uh, Sarah was saying, first and foremost is the humanitarian crisis. There are uh, almost half a million IDPs already uh, in Kabul and other uh, major cities. Uh, there, there are refugees uh, coming to Pakistan, Iran, and other neighboring countries. And the neighboring countries are not opening their doors, unfortunately. The states uh, who are uh, even organizing war in Afghanistan don't have uh, don't, don't abide by humanitarian uh, international laws. Okay, so, so Afshap, that... I will I will wrap you up uh, here because. What what you're saying is is of course of, of uh, very high importance. Trying to understand, but we will come back to that in the second part of our of our conversation. What I wanted to hear now is what is happening now, and you also refer to the humanitarian uh, crisis, but also, and that's important to take to the second round of uh, of our uh, inputs, the fact that there is a big interference going on, not just wrapping up, but beginning uh, in, in Afghanistan or with this new uh, dispensation. Let me go to Achin and ask him the same question. What's going on these past days, uh, Achin, in Afghanistan? And what should we really highlight? Okay, well, thank you for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, even as progressive voices within the media and progressive forces outside must continue to oppose uh, uh, the uh, very repressive practices and perspectives of the Taliban and similar organizations. In the light of what has happened in the last few days, and even in the last few hours, I think it's very, very important that we progressives oppose the military re-engagement by the United States, supported by NATO through its drones and its uh, assurances of further bomb attacks, incidentally civilians have also been killed uh, to protect its occupying forces. Yeah. The United States should get out and stay out. And it is very important that this, uh, what it has done is not emulated later on by other forces which in the name of human rights uh, will seek to justify and carry out uh, external military intervention. Yeah. In the next session, I would, uh, while I will say something about uh, what I think progressive forces, civil society should, can and should do, I'll be focusing basically on what Pakistan, Iran, China, and Russia uh, will want to do, which itself depends upon the evolving uncertain situation and developments within uh, yeah. Afghanistan itself. Okay, we we'll look out for for that because it's very important. But uh, the 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 one thing that you highlight here is U.S. military re-engagement. It's while they're pulling out, they're re-engaging uh, with different uh, 
instruments with the drones and but with similar uh, and catastrophic effect as we've seen uh, yesterday with the drone attack that killed uh, so many uh, civilians again. Anurada, same question for you. Yes, thank you. I'm uh, delighted to be here uh, with this wonderful uh, panel. And uh, to say that uh, I actually agree with all my co-panelists so far, but I have two uh, additional points to make right now. One is that we oppose the military re-engagement. And second, there is a very clear and quick legitimization going on of the Taliban. So again, uh, civil society must continuously warn against excusing the Taliban and allowing them to have this, uh, the same kind of religious fundamentalist regime. Uh, it's not up to civil society to endorse the Taliban. That's the thing. The third is that whatever analysis I see in the press, one thing which is missing is that there are constant and repeat patterns in the conflicts in Afghanistan. This pattern comes from a combination of three elements. One is imperialism and militarist intervention. Second, these imperialist and interventions are backed by imperial and militarist knowledge construction. And three, these are superimposed on local power and ethnic conflicts. And therefore, between all these three trends, they combine and promote, number one, they oppress Afghan people. Second, they promote global Islamophobia. And third, they promote religious extremism across the globe. So I will speak about these patterns in the later minutes that I yeah. have. Thank you. Okay, we will uh, find that probably very engaging as well. Let's round up the first question. What's happening that we should look at maybe more closely than, uh, than media or public are doing right now? Curry, if you look from Washington, what do you see that we should keep an eye on too? Well, thank you. I'm really honored to be here. And uh, I've got the, the easy job because, of course, I find myself in agreement with my co-panelists. And if I could just add a few points about the, the points that, that um, my colleagues have made about the occupation itself, the two decade project of the occupation, what's happening right now, uh, particularly in the media and especially the US media is it's, it's not that there is not a critique of that project. There's actually a rehabilitation and re-legitimization of it. And so neoconservative voices who were part of the invasion 20 years ago, people like Condoleezza Rice and Paul Wolfowitz now have op-eds in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. This is absolutely you know, appalling. And so that, that critique um, needs to come through. Relatedly, second point is that uh, as, as there is, needs to be an interrogation of the entire two decade project of the occupation, there needs to be an interrogation of the withdrawal itself and the decisions that were made uh, that were part of it. So just briefly an example, uh, the, the, the US pulled out uh, before, before the uh, withdrawal now in August, in June, of course, the, the U.S. pulled out of the uh, air base of just, just north of uh, Kabul, um, Bagram. the Bagram Air Base. And actually, the month prior, the U.S. positioned an aircraft carrier, the USS Ronald Reagan, in the Arabian Sea so that it could maintain bombing operations, even though they were pulled out of Bagram. They also uh, arranged to maintain bombing operations out of Qatar. And so they figured out how to continue to bomb Afghanistan, um, despite withdrawing from Bagram and the other air bases, but they did not figure out anything. There was no plan about evacuating the refugees. That has to be interrogated. The last point I think is just highlighting the protests that Afghans are leading in Afghanistan right now, particularly Afghan women, uh, which of course is in a proud tradition of, of women's resistance. This is important, not only you know, in and of itself, but because the kind of re-legitimization of the maintaining operations hinges on the notion that the US is somehow protecting women, where in fact, Afghan women are speaking for themselves and fighting for themselves right now. Yep. Those are very important points. And I, I think that uh, the, the 
the fact of this rehabilitation of a of a 20 year occupation uh, is something that is happening in in Europe as well and uh, be interested to hear if that is also what play in, for instance, in Pakistan and India in the region, because uh, it will define where we will be going from here. But before we look at, uh, at the future, we have to go a little bit deeper than we were able until now to look at what has been happening until now. What, what was the reality? What were the motives? What were the dynamics of the 20 year intervention? And of course, of the now 43 year running conflict, war, violence that has been uh, devastating Afghanistan to its very core uh, and which have, I've described the, that long period of violence uh, as the first world war of the 21st century. It, uh, because it is, as Anuradha said, it is, there is an element of local conflicts or, or, or uh, conflict of interests or, or of vision, but it has been overwritten by regional and superpower interests that intervened, that used the, the local players' interest coalitions. So in that sense, I've always argued that it is a kind of a first world war for this century. And, and in order to answer that and to make an end to it, we should understand it, what has been happening and why has it been happening. So I would like to give a little bit more time now to each speaker to develop uh, on the question, why are we where we are now? What has driven the main players to bring us here? And, and what should the global public understand about the conflict uh, in Afghanistan. Sahar, let's hear first from you what you have to bring to that question. Well, uh, as you said, in order to understand uh, what happens and where we are today, it's, um, it's important, but we don't have time to go back to the last 40 years and what happened uh, in, since 1979. Uh, in Afghanistan, and uh, it was then when most of the progressive Afghans, uh, in, uh, including women, including the organization that I was working with, uh, talked about the, the danger of these fundamentalist religious extremist terrorists uh, and support to them. And we all know in the history shows, and it's very uh, fact-based, um, uh, that how these groups were empowered through money, through weapons, and imposed on Afghan people. So I don't want to go to that history and what happened and what consequences it brought for Afghanistan and its people. And this is uh, the last 20 years is a continuation of that whole process, which started by the USA and its uh, other allies uh, in the West and in the region. Most importantly, uh, as Afrasia Fatek also talked about Iran and Pakistan and many other uh, Arab countries. Uh, last 20 years, uh, what happened and how it resulted to today is because it all started with lie, with a big lie. Uh, to Afghan people and to uh, the people of the world and all uh, the people of the countries uh, which were involved in Afghanistan, which occupied Afghanistan. So um, it's very obvious that they were not there to really uh, build, establish, or support uh, um, Afghanistan, the country, to rebuild it. They were there for their own political interests, for their own uh, uh, agendas in Afghanistan, even if they uh, try to uh, deny the fact that Afghanistan maybe has nothing to offer them. But the question is, if it didn't have anything, so why you were there? Why you spent millions and billions of dollars and, and put your own people uh, at risk? So this is one aspect of the, what happened, because you know it's a defeat for uh, the USA, the, the uh, NATO allies. But at the same time, it was not because of the Taliban or any resistance from 
their side. It was because of their own lies and their own failures and their own uh, what dislike they have gotten from their own people. If we look at the USA uh, and how uh, people are protesting and what issues and problems they are themselves are facing. So this is the international or the um, outside factors, it's very important. But then, of course, why it failed? Because despite our request, and I would say all those uh, progressive and uh, freedom-loving human rights people like us, we asked for the UN intervention, in, in, if nothing else. So that was, uh, we asked for that in order to disarm all the armed forces, all the armed parties, and uh, groups that were involved there. But instead we saw uh, Afghanistan was handed over to the criminal, uh, brutal world laws, fundamentalists, the most importantly, the Northern Alliance fundamentalists, which we unfortunately uh, even now see in the media uh, to give a different image to them again and to revive them. And it, it's a betrayal to Afghanistan and its people. So corrupt, corruption, corrupt people, people who didn't care about Afghanistan or its people, dishonest people, they came to power. All they cared was for their own personal interests, for their families, for their own political interests. And we don't see any uh, uh, real and honest uh, efforts to really rebuild or uh, to help Afghanistan to stand uh, on its own or the people. So this this one was all, this should not be forgotten. Uh, uh, if there was honesty, so it should not have happened. We asked for this. The other thing is also that the there was no support to, uh, or very little to those who uh, um, actually resisted and who wanted a different Afghanistan. So uh, this uh, never those criminals brought to any kind of uh, trial, we, which we asked for. Uh, and instead, uh, what we saw also, the other factor is that everything, almost everything, any kind of support, financial or otherwise, was invested in many hundreds or thousands of uh, both international and, and local or national NGOs. So where that money went, yes, I, I agree. There were some who work hard, who work honestly, but most of them were there just to uh, to work for the interest of those who were funding them. And most of that money, if we just talk about the financial aspect of it, went back to their own pockets. So it didn't, it never reached to, to the real uh, people and their need. So all of these uh, factors and many more combined led to what we uh, see today. And it was not uh, unexpected. Yes, it, it happened very, um, uh, rapidly also because of the betrayal, because of the deal and um, hidden deal that were made with the Taliban. And we all know that how they were uh, ordered, for example, if you talk about the security forces or the Afghan military. So they were ordered not to fight because that was a deal that was made uh, between the Taliban and between the Afghan government and also uh, the USA. So many factors led to what uh, where we are today. But the, the painful thing is that is, it has been in the last 40 years that again, it's we, it's the people of Afghanistan who uh, are suffering and will suffer. And no. this should not be allowed. We don't deserve this. Anyone in Afghanistan uh, doesn't deserve this. I have one quick question, because in the beginning you said uh, it was portrayed as a nation building effort, as uh, an intervention uh, that uh, was meant to build up human security, women's rights, human rights. That was not what it was about. Why? What was the interest, according to you, of the West to spend all the time, resources and human lives in Afghanistan for 20 years? 
Well, it's the geopolitic interest they have in the region, but also, I mean, all of these uh, these uh, imperialist countries uh, need to uh, have their uh, weaponry or their uh, war machines going on. So where should they uh, have uh, done that better than Afghanistan, unfortunately? So Afghanistan became a, a battleground and um, a, a place where they, they could test all of their political and uh, military uh, purposes or you know actions or whatever so yeah. but i mean the the history that 20 years shows that if it was otherwise so we could have not seen today what's happening in afghanistan so this is the uh, great example but i must also say that despite this the people of afghanistan and despite the fact that we hear, unfortunately, from Biden and many others that Orientalist view of their of Afghanistan, that Afghan people were uh, in war or they uh, are like that, it's not true. It, it, forget about the the history of Afghanistan, but look at the last twenty years. Whenever Afghan people got any opportunity, very little opportunities, they have put all their energy and everything in order to to change that society, yeah. to uh, to work for development, to work for peace, to work for uh, human rights and, and freedom. Okay, thank you very much for uh, for your insights. Let's move across the border to uh, to Islamabad and, and here from Afrasiab, who already uh, gave a first glimpse of his analysis of what happened. Please, Afrasiab, uh, could you develop that now a little bit further? Yes, actually, uh, all we all know that uh, Islam was uh, weaponized by dollars and petrodollars in nineteen eighties in the war against Soviet Union. And uh, Taliban's are the product of the same factories that were supported by US and Arab kings and European uh, countries uh, in 1980s and early 90s. So uh, after bone process, uh, after 9-11, when Taliban were dislodged, US came here to a strategic region where it wanted uh, to uh, have bases. So it, it, it stay put here, but it, it brought uh, a sort of, uh, a, a, it brought a Western model democracy, I mean, the government uh, in Afghanistan, state structure, but it also kept this Taliban and religious extremism alive. You see, Taliban were not declared terrorists as organization. There were some individuals and some small factions in Taliban that were declared terrorists for Taliban, but you see this republic was supposed to uh, become a magnet for five uh, Central Asian republics with authoritarian state systems and for Sinkiang. Uh, so so the, the system was uh, built. But then after 2003, when US went to Iraq war, they, it lost focus in Afghanistan, particularly in 2008, after the recession of the capitalist crisis, uh, China be became a strong competitor uh, in as economic superpower to compete with US and uh, European countries. So then uh, after that, uh, US uh, mind change, US strategy change. Uh, it was particularly, I mean, the 2013 was decisive when China declared its road and belt uh, program for the world, uh, which could become the basis of a new world order, China-centric world order. So that then US changed its strategy altogether. So, so the, the so-called republic, which was main and uh, the Taliban or the Islamization was secondary. They brought the secondary thing to prime position. Uh, uh, I mean, the main position uh, and this uh, Republic thing was uh, dismantled. It is they decided to disown it. So Afghanistan was very dependent uh, and U US could really uh, change things. Uh, and it, it, it is really a good example of imperialist uh, uh, is political engineering in making and unmaking of dependent states. And it has proved very clearly uh, that in Afghanistan, uh, and, and US still is busy in drone attacks uh, because, because it wants to keep its rate in the region. This over the horizon attacks 
uh, so-called or the original tax. You see, and this IS, IS is nothing. It's, it has no connection with Middle East. It, it, is, it is a new edition of terrorism, uh, which is produced in the same factories which produced Mujahideen in 1980s, Taliban in 1990s, and now IS in uh, these uh, 2020s. So Afish, let's not... Afish, can, can I quickly in, intervene and ask a question? Because as you paint uh, the, the picture, it, it's, it's quite logic and, and clear. But what is the advantage for an imperialist power like the United States to lose a war in Afghanistan? Because that is the perception that uh, that is now all over the world that the US lost it. And, and so how can they profit from it? Actually, uh, this is a fixed match. It, it, I mean, they haven't lo lost a war. Actually, uh, it, it is very interesting. U US had military base in Pakistan, in Balochistan, Pasni, you, you remember Pasni, the hmm. military base from which drone used to fly. And, and Taliban had their shura or council or parallel state in Quetta, hmm. not, not very far away from each other. They wouldn't fight in Pakistan. Both of them would go to Afghanistan to fight. If 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 US had yeah. any intention really of uh, eliminating terrorism, it could have uh, addressed the question of uh, sanctuaries in Pakistan. It did not because it did not want really to dismantle because the US thinks it's it's a regional problem. The problem is for China, Russia, and Iran, not for uh, uh, US mainland US. Of course, Al Qaeda or other organizations they have been hitting, but not Taliban. Taliban they say is a traditional Islam, rural Islam which is very good to invite Central Asians, Xinjiang, and also compete with uh, Shia, Iran. It, it, another theocracy, Sunni theocracy in Afghanistan, competing with uh, Shia theocracy. So, so the, all these are very strategic things for US. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, for that clarification and, and for the, the way that you uh, quickly run through uh, more than 40 years of history and, and trying to highlight some uh, stepping stones to where we find ourselves now. Achin, uh, let's get your analysis. You announced the, the, the main players that you want to look into. Um, please give us your view. Yes, um, I won't be looking at the past, but I will be uh, uh, saying something about possible developments now and in the coming period. Okay. And of course, let's be very clear that the major neighboring powers as well as the uh, European states and the US and so on, will shed crocodile tears for the Afghan people. But these states are much, much more concerned with pushing what they consider to be their important economic and political interests. However, with regard to the neighboring powers and uh, US and others, this will also be connected to what happens within Afghanistan. They would like some kind of stability, uh, but on what terms? And what do I mean by possible developments in Afghanistan, which will shape their uh, approaches? Two things, Taliban, one, what will Taliban do about the Haqqani network and forces like ISIS outside of it? Because these are forces which are anti-Shia and which are committed to the export of radical Islam, which creates problems for neighboring states. Second, will the Taliban move towards sharing of power of some kind and spoils with others, be it the Karzai, the Abdullahs, the Masoods, or the other warlords and so on? In other words, will they provide some kind of a stability this way? Otherwise, there is a real possibility of a civil war type situation again emerging, which none of these Dalian countries and others particularly like because it makes the pursuit of their interests uh, much more difficult here. Let's take China. China would be very happy to go along with the Taliban regime, but it is concerned that the East Pakistan Islamic movement, which is connected to the uh, Uyghurs, uh, should be kept under control. Hmm? In which case, of course, it's very happy. It has already important uh, economic uh, de development uh, in copper mining. Afghanistan is enormously rich in a whole series of uh, of, of metals and could actually develop substantially through an extractive uh, policy, extractive uh, developmental policy, which of course has very negative perspectives with regard to the environment and elsewhere. Huh? 
but this would really depend upon foreign support. The uh, Afghanistan has the largest lithium reserves in the world, which is very, very important to the information age, and China is the world's largest lithium consumer. And of course, China would like to push the BRI to Pakistan and then to Iran. And let us not forget that the kind of containment policy of the US and NATO, both European and Asian NATO countries, like the Asian NATO, India, Australia, and so on, pushes a kind of formation of a counter quartet of Pakistan, China, Iran, and uh, Russia here. So that's uh, China. What about Pakistan? Historically, Pakistan's geopolitical importance to the United States was towards West Asia, where it had a strong connection with Saudi Arabia, and towards Central Asia. Both of these now have profoundly diminished for the United States. The United States now has connections with Saudi Arabia, UAE, and along with Israel, and so on. And Pakistan is much less relevant. And now that they are out of Afghanistan, the importance of Pakistan for Central Asia becomes less, which doesn't mean that the United States doesn't want to intervene in Central Asia, but it look to the Central Asian republics. Hmm. So the Pakistans also want some kind of stabilization for this Taliban regime to establish itself. It doesn't want a refugee influx. It doesn't want opium. And it would like to move towards a situation where it can be part of this counter project. What about Iran? Iran is Shia, but is perfectly happy to go along with the Sunni pro-Taliban uh, uh, Sunni if it can stabilize matters, provided it doesn't make complications for it by attacking the Hazaras who are Shias. So this question of Akani and others becomes important. And of course, it doesn't want refugees and opium uh, trade coming in there. What about Russia? Russia would like to economically develop. Huh? It doesn't want, here it's very important, it sees its sphere of influence as being the Central Asian Republics of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and um, 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 Tajikistan, particularly Tajikistan. These highly, well, sec uh, secular, but highly authoritarian regimes have actually resulted in the opposition to them being Islamic groups, Islamic fundamental groups, which have some connection with their uh, ethnic uh, supporters in these regions. And here again, the question, of what is going to happen with regard to whether they will be contained and not allowed to uh, promote the resistance in these Central Asian republics, huh? which is something that these governments and the Russians do not want. Of course, uh, so that of course becomes an important question and they too are very much concerned about building a counter, uh, counter quartet. Incidentally, the United States does come in here because the United States has not given up on this idea of having some kind of a base in the Central Asian republics, particularly Uzbekistan, which is more independent than the others. But what can happen is that if you have this kind of fundamental resistance growing in these Central Asian republics, then these governments may well want to play off Russia and the United States and even invite the United States to help us with regard to how to deal with these forces here. Uh, is that, so is that still an, uh, a possibility? Because that was uh, in, say, Two decades ago, that was the game that was pretty much on the table. It's yes, quite right, it was. But what happened, of course, was that in Tajikistan, they were able to, uh, they were told to move out uh, their yeah. military relationship in 2005. And in Uzbekistan, it was moved out in 2015. But these are not governments, although the Russians want them to be maintained sphere of influence, they would like to retain some independence and flexibility for themselves. So depending upon what emerges in this very, very complicated future situation, don't rule that out. Although sure. one can see that possibility here. Lastly, let me just come to the question of India and then civil society here. In the case of India, India is not a major player. India will, independent of the United States, may or may not open diplomatic relations with the new regime. But as for a serious relationship, some kind with Afghanistan, this is utterly subordinate to this far more important relationship with the United States. And therefore, it will be reactive uh, to, to pa Pakistan to what the emerging relationship between the United States and, uh, and Afghanistan is. But this ugly Modi Hindu, Hindu nationalist regime will certainly be using the criticisms of Taliban justified as they are, but utterly unjustified defense of their own Islamophobia and promotion of their Hindu nationalism. As for the question of 
what shall shall we keep the civil society for the last round Achin, yes, because that sure. that's when we will all look into that there's there's the question of uh, of the conflict or the tension and i would say the conflict between pakistan and india uh, how much does that play uh, in today's prospects and developments in afghanistan but the distinction between the modi regime and previous regimes i think it has in its foreign policy behavior is not that different from others, but it is deliberately building up Pakistan as the enemy as much as possible. And it uses what happens externally to justify and promote its own anti-Muslim uh, Hindu uh, domestic behavior. Yeah. And it wants to assert itself. So that I think is the much more important uh, aspect, yeah. uh, painting Pakistan as the evil in a way, yeah. uh, in a way which is even stronger than previous regimes. Before, before I go on to Anurada, there's what there was one question after Shab that I wanted to to ask you. Uh, I haven't. Nobody has yet mentioned the Durand line, the the border between oh. Afghanistan and That's Pakistan, clear. which which is the big worry of Islamabad that yeah. none of the regimes in Afghanistan has ever recognized the yeah. Durand line as a proper uh, international border, not even the Taliban in the 90s. Do you expect them to do that now to appease Islamabad and to help them to recognize the, the new uh, regime in the new Taliban government if it is formed? No, I don't think so. You see, this, this is um, uh, more of a pretension. I mean, during the line, Afghanistan has not raised this question for, for the last five decades in any international forum. So it is not that hot a question. Pakistan mm -hmm. uses it when it wants to, but actually Pakistan doesn't recognize the different line. But they, they, it has been sending hundreds and thousands of people to Afghanistan to fight. The Taliban's uh, parallel government has been sitting for the last two decades in Pakistan, in Quetta. So, so uh, Pakistan doesn't recognize the different line for, for, for asking yeah. Afghanistan first, it has to recognize it. Okay. So I, I think that's mere potential. It wants to hegemonize the entire Afghanistan. Yeah. It, it wants to uh, turn Afghanistan into a protectorate like it was in 19th century under British Empire. Pakistan wants to replace British Empire. Okay, thanks for that uh, quick and snap. Reaction, Anuradha. Uh, please bring to our discussion your perspectives on what has happened and how we should understand where we are today. Yes, so I'll go deeper into my perspective of uh, this repeat pattern and constant. And uh, this is in two spheres: one of imperialism and intervention, where first British colonialism used Afghanistan as a buffer between Russia and uh, the advance to the British colonial possessions in South Asia in the 19th century. Second, the Russians used intervention in Afghanistan to fortify their positions in the Cold War, as we know, trying to uphold a pro-Soviet um, Afghan regime. And then whatever followed, the creation of the Taliban, the Mujahideen, backed by the US and Pakistan, and the massive inflow of arms and mercenaries. And then the Russian withdrawal, which saw, which was seen as a geostrategic victory by the US and its allies and by Pakistan. Third, again, the US quest for revenge for 9-11 terror attacks and thereby directly entering the Afghan civil strife, which uh, the US intervention did give a blow to Al-Qaeda, but it was also advantageous for the US geostrategic desire to reconstruct all of West Asia. As you can see from the twin war of Afghanistan and as Iraq showed, almost the same time as um, Afghanistan. And now the US withdrawal is again being seen as a victory by Russia, China, Pakistan, and by forces of religious fundamentalism. Now the fourth in this is that regional powers and their conflicts and militarisms are in play in Afghanistan continuously to date. So if Pakistan has supported the Taliban and the nurturing of the Taliban, India supported the Northern Alliance. And even now, the Northern Alliance is seen as heroes, again in the press. Uh, 
US versus Iran and Iraq have played out in Afghanistan on the borders. Saudi Arabia and Turkey and their search for regional influence has played out in Afghanistan and its militarism. So all the internal divisions in Afghan civil war, all these countries have used and continue to use these. And you can see this in how they are repositioning themselves uh, in this. So there is going to be a repeat again, unless Afghanistan itself can stand up against all outsiders. Then second point is knowledge construction that support these interventions. Now, Imperial, as Seher said in the beginning, this knowledge construction presents the Afghan society and state as tribalist, violent, backward, without capacity for a modern state, and therefore open to intervention. In fact, Biden used this old British analogy, saying that this is a graveyard for empires. Now, this itself is ahistorical as uh, you know, Britain had actually won one of the three uh, wars uh, against Afghanistan, and it is racialized, and it shows Afghans as relics of this graveyard. And anyway, war, all wars produce graveyards, not just Afghanistan. Second is a securitized narrative of victory versus defeat. And you can see that some countries are saying victory for us, others are saying defeat. No one is talking of the Afghan people, or they're talking about protecting their own borders, as Achin has shown. Russia wants to just protect Russia and send the Central Asian borders. Uh, Iran wants to just talk about its own borders. So then there's a revival of talk like the great game, the new great game, and where Afghan people are made as subjects continuously. And moreover, uh, this great game and the Silk Route again has been revived in China, Chinese dialogue as a a precedent for the Belt and Road Initiative. So yes, the Chinese want, might want stability and investments over there, but they're also seeing it uh, as part of the, uh, the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Then third is the perception of threat perception by EU and the Indians, uh, who see this primarily as a threat from terrorism, uh, Islamic fundamentalism, not looking at their own fundamentalisms, uh, and drug trafficking. After all, uh, the Taliban has sat on a huge narco state, actually, which produced 90,000 tons of drugs the last few years uh, and distributed it across Central Asia, Pakistan, India, etc. Uh, so all these approaches just, just, and this kind of to, knowledge construction is to, actually, yeah. Yeah, if I just can, can add, because uh, it was not just the Taliban that were sitting on this drug economy, that was also financing people on the side of the sitting regime of people in, in power. So yes. is, is there a chance that this drug economy will now be reduced now that we have a different power equilibrium? Well, I think it will be used as a leverage to get in aid. And if they're not given assistance, then they would use this, uh, the drug economy. It's too, and it employs millions of Afghan people. Uh, the, it, it is part of the, the rural uh, uh, agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you'll have to give uh, employment to millions. Uh, there is also the shadow economy. There is the corrupt economy. Even now, Seher would know uh, people were uh, giving money to get a, get onto the evacuation planes. Uh, I believe twenty five thousand US dollars. So all this is common knowledge in our region, and but we all know that how terribly it's impacting the Afghan people, and how this new regime, the Taliban, is going to use this to get legitimacy, uh, to extort more money. But they have they have to be held accountable, and they cannot. Uh, continue with this kind of either politics or political economy. Thank yeah. you. Anurada, you said that uh, in, in your first part, you said that uh, the, all the interference and the meddling of uh, regional or superpowers should end or can only end if Afghanistan can stand up for itself. Now, what are the chances that is happening uh, after the Taliban take power just two weeks ago? 
sadly, it doesn't seem that there are great chances because the Taliban, even the state structures which were existing from the uh, previous regime and from the Americans, they're not using those structures. They're using their own structures. So they're bypassing state institutions, whatever little there were, and using their own uh, you know, very autonomous structures to take decisions. Uh, if people are being killed, they're saying, oh, this is an autonomous group and they're not used to the new system. So currently there's no regime. There is, uh, there is no governance. The Haqqani network apparently uh, controls uh, uh, Kabul. Uh, so uh, uh, it will really have to be a huge effort to bring back these structures, which yeah. we can discuss in our last section on, yeah. on civil society. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let me wrap this section up with Curry uh, and, and your uh, analysis. You've been looking into the situation in Afghanistan from your own perspective for uh, for a number of years. So what do you see and, and what you think you want to share with the with the audience on this? Right. Yeah. Uh, so I'll speak a bit about the, the kind of U.S. end of things and just start with a, a bit of a step back and say that so much of what we've seen over the past two decades and really this past couple of months, I think come from the fact that in the US there was cultivated this kind of Western fantasy of Afghanistan. Um, you know, Anurada was just talking about the echoes of British colonialism um, and the kind of uh, British visions that the British empire sought to impose upon Afghanistan. And those, those echoes reverberate today and are quite familiar actually. And so when we think about the Afghan military that was constructed, that was cultivated, this is a military that was imagined in Washington and imposed, uh, superimposed on Afghanistan. Uh, there was a, a kind of Afghan politics and society imagined in Washington. Um, and then uh, the idea was to impose that by the occupation. Now, I want to be careful and, and clear that Afghans have been agents uh, in their own reality these past couple of decades. And, and you know, there's been much engagement and interaction with the U.S. operations as part of that, uh, as Afghans have sought to pursue their own visions in, in you know, in this 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 new context after so many different contexts. But Afghans have not been allowed to to direct their society. Those frames were imposed by Washington, and it, it didn't the, the, it didn't work. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think that this just to remind us, um, you know, it's and it's a, the conversation has changed so much even over the the course of the past several weeks, but the kind of um, swiftness with which the Afghan military fell uh, and the surprise that um, resulted in the US and particularly in Washington, I think in so many ways was the product of the fact that this fantasy that Washington had didn't match up with the reality. I think that they really believed that, that if they just pumped enough billions of dollars, if they just sent enough weapons, um, if they just put the right people in place, then the U.S. vision for Afghanistan uh, would survive. And, and obviously, it's been a, a different reality has, has kind of played out. The last point, on, just on this as part of this point, it's not just a fantasy of Afghanistan that was um, developed in Washington, but a fantasy of the United States uh, as this kind of benevolent actor that was there to help Afghanistan. The reality, I think, goes to what other folks uh, have said on the panel, is that this is really, in so many ways, uh, two decades ago, there was an effort to project US power as part of the war on terror. And Afghanistan was, um, very unfortunately and tragically for Afghans, selected as a kind of test, test case uh, for this, what was supposed to be a new era of US power. Uh, Neoconservative actors in Washington at the time used disgusting terms like low hanging fruit to describe countries like Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, the idea was that the US would invade Afghanistan easily and move on to Iraq and then move on to more challenging uh, countries to invade like Iran, that, that Afghanistan would simply be a context to develop momentum uh, in this, this whole uh, series of operations. And I just want to say a word about what those operations looked like because a, a description of what the United States did over these past two decades has been utterly absent, at least in the US media. Um, I'm not sure about elsewhere. 
but we've gone from, you know, at the moment, there's kind of nonstop coverage of Afghanistan in the media. But this comes after years of no coverage. There's been nothing about uh, what, what, what is happening in Afghanistan and what the US is doing. So just to, to recount some of the, the lowlights, the use of uh, these incredible weapons, so-called daisy cutter bombs, or the massive ordnance air blast, also known as the mother of all bombs, weapons like these used in Afghanistan uh, and used in clandestine ways. Um, Afghan journalists like Ali T Latifi tried to investigate the impact of the use of the, the so-called mother of all bombs and was restricted from doing so as a journalist by US forces. Uh, we have to talk about the air assault on a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Kunduz in 2015, uh, an incident that happened that was not just a, a kind of mistaken errant bomb that was dropped in this hospital, but 30 minutes of air assault uh, by US forces for which there was no real accountability. Doctors Without Borders called for international investigations into this incident, and those never came. The US investigated itself uh, and, and kind of um, you know, took care of things itself. Uh, we have to talk about the, the black sites, the, the uh, innovations in torture uh, that, that the US developed in Afghanistan over these two decades. Uh, and so again, when we talk about Bagram Air Base, when the US withdrew from Bagram uh, several weeks ago, there was no conversation about the fact that this was a site of torture for many years uh, for, for Afghan prisoners, or the so-called salt pit, another CIA uh, black site. And that in many ways, uh, these sites and these techniques, these technologies, not only of torture itself, but of hiding it, were incubated in Afghanistan and then rolled out in other places all around the world. Um, and then lastly, a point about the Afghan forces themselves and that the US uh, cultivated, armed, et cetera, and their abuses uh, as well. So, so there has not been a real conversation or serious interrogation of uh, this history. And it therefore makes the current moment very complicated because the United States is at the moment framing itself once again as this benevolent actor who is trying to evacuate Afghans from this sort of unfortunate situation without any reckoning with the fact that the United States itself is responsible in so many ways uh, for that situation. The last point I'll, I'll make is that this is, of course, critically important when we talk about Afghanistan in itself, but actually for other places as well, because keep in mind that the US is still carrying out uh, you know, so-called counter-terror operations in various countries uh, around the world, and actually in many ways expanding <laughs> the, the, the war on terror. And so it's really critical, again, that we have this, this, this critical interrogation of what the US has done in Afghanistan and what it's doing now, because the fate of Afghans rests on it, but also the fate of so many people around the world. Yeah. In that context, one quick question: uh, You refer to to the mistakes, uh, to the to the fantasies that uh, that Washington cultivated for itself. That if they put in enough money, if they worked with the right people, then things would work the way they they wanted. Is that I've been asking this question to many people uh, in the past decades? Is that a failure? Because I can, I can hardly imagine that a system that is so large, so well-funded, so full of intelligence, that it can just not understand what they're doing. So I've, I've always been asking, is this a failure of intelligence or is it something deeper? Right. I think the point, the, the main point is that the entire premise that the United States you know, knows what's best for Afghanistan and that the world would somehow be better after the US launched the war on terror. This entire premise is, is false. And I, you know, again, we can talk about Afghanistan, we can talk about places all around the world to see how catastrophic uh, this has been. Within that context, uh, you can see that there are all kinds of miscalculations. Uh, but I, I think that the tendency, especially when it comes to the Pentagon itself, they'll say, oh, we were mistaken apparently when we, you know, we, we, we hurt the wrong people or we expected this military to last longer. But they don't, they don't question the underlying assumptions uh, that under 
underlie the whole project uh, to begin with, which, which is which is wrong. So so in, in that sense, you know, I don't think the United States makes mistakes. <laughs> um, you know, th there are miscalculations that come, but th those those come in a broader context of uh, you know a, a problematic project. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've we've got a lot of building blocks uh, to work on, and and it it would be presumptuous to think that uh, in in an hour time we will explain uh, in full a conflict so complicated and so old as as the one that's going on in Afghanistan. But you certainly helped us to look at it from uh, from new ways and with uh, with different angles. Now we would like to move on and, and uh, take on from, from what uh, has been already hinted to uh, by a number of you, uh, what can we do? What should be done? What are possibilities to make the future a better place uh, than the past four decades for Afghans? So <clears throat> and we try to look at it with a special attention for what um, movements, organizations, NGOs, what civil society can bring to that table, what they can mean for Afghans, either in Afghanistan, in the neighboring countries where they live as refugees, or in the wider world as a, as a diaspora. Sahar, could you give us a few ideas of what should or could be done to help Afghans build a better future or to let them build it, uh, not just to do it in their place, obviously, Sahar. Um, well, uh, as we see, uh, unfortunately, in the media, and as uh, the panelists have rightly talked about, that uh, there are different interests in Afghanistan regional, and of course, they are trying to uh, deal with Taliban in different ways and use this so-called stability or whatever, which may, uh, which I don't believe well, but according to them, will come to Taliban. So. Uh, um, our demand or our request, especially from uh, different social movements and uh, human rights movements and all those who are interested and want to do something for Afghanistan, is to put uh, um, pressure and to demand for no recognition for Taliban from any side in whatever way, because that is really, <clears throat> that will be really uh, a big disaster in betrayal to Afghanistan and its people. So this is what we uh, would ask uh, through uh, showing solidarity and through sympathy and through raising uh, 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 their voice uh, against all those who are, who are involved and who are trying to uh, recognize this uh, regime. So just, which, just, a, uh, just a question yeah. there, uh, Sar, because we've already heard from the United States and some European governments that they won't recognize and that they will cut all the aid as long as the Taliban are uh, are uh, holding on to to their monopolistic power. Don't you fear that if you say don't recognize the new regime, that that will aggravate the humanitarian crisis that is already showing? No, because there, there should be found other ways. And that, that was my other point, that uh, while not recognize this regime, which is not capable of uh, really um, uh, ruling or really uh, uh, administrating a country as uh, uh, Nuranda saw rightly, that they are not capable. They have no uh, such um, capacities or abilities to do so. But at the same time, there are, for example, through the United Nations and different other agencies to really uh, take care of this humanitarian crisis that's happening there. Uh, so this it doesn't mean that um, while not recognized there should it will um, stop the um, help or support to the Afghan people. Uh, I don't think so and if they are really interested there are different ways to to do so. So this is one thing and the other thing is also that this uh, huge uh, refugee crisis and also the um, um, human rights activists who are in danger. So it should 
also not be forgotten. Our fear uh, and concern is that as soon as uh, all the US forces leave, which I don't know by tomorrow is the deadline in all other European countries. So Afghanistan once again will be uh, on the way to be forgotten. And this, uh, and also to show that things are uh, okay and they can manage living there. And so that's our also our concern that these people should be evacuated, they should be protected because this is the responsibility of all those who created this, yeah. uh, this disaster and this uh, catastrophe. Uh, there's also a big need, because we should remember that this is not uh, the same time as uh, in 90s when the Taliban for the first time uh, came to power or to uh, Afghanistan. It was a different Afghanistan in different time. Afghanistan was in civil war for four years, a brutal civil war. People were tired and people uh, had not really uh, um, any big, uh, uh, picture of the Taliban. It was a so-called new established movement and uh, it was a different time. But Afghanistan and its people now after these 20, 25 years are different people. So they uh, have, uh, uh, with a lot of efforts, tirelessly achieved a lot. And it's so painful, painful to see uh, that they are losing that and they will not. We have, as we maybe talked about that there, there have been protests in different um, uh, parts of the country by women and maybe we have someone who was actually who actually organized a protest against the Taliban in Kabul so these people these women should be supported should be uh, protected uh, and should be given a chance an opportunity to raise their voice so this is really uh, an important thing at least that we uh, can think of and should do. Okay, thank you very much. Afishap, uh, can we get your ideas about what could or should happen next? I think I agree with uh, Sahar that uh, we should uh, sort of uh, keep seeing the Taliban is an occupation militia sent from a neighboring country, from Pakistan, and supported by other neighboring countries and world powers for their games. And it, it, there are UN reports that it is accompanied by a terror syndicate. Al-Qaeda, for example, is there according to UN reports. Uh, this Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, MIIMU. Uh, this uh, East Turkestan Islamic movement, uh, a movement from Tajikistan, and TTP from Pakistan. All these groups are there with Taliban. So it's the terror syndicate is there. Uh, I'm saying that, I mean, I, I don't think we will be able to stop others to, uh, to recognize, but what we can remind about the illegitimacy uh, of a militia, which has no uh, social contract. You see, uh, Afghan government had many problems. There was a lot of corruption. There was a lot of misgovernance, uh, so many things. But you see, there were not a single demonstration in favor of Taliban during all these last few weeks when Taliban were advancing militarily. People were fleeing. I mean, people don't like them. I mean, they, they, they don't have political capital and, and they don't care about political vision. So, so I think we should keep on uh, exposing them and attacking them. Secondly, I want to say that every uh, project, when, uh, even imperialist project, has unintended consequences. You see, Afghanistan, major challenge was that it was pre-modern. It, it lived in pre-modernity in 20th century. You see, uh, uh, in these uh, few years, it has gradually modernized. Uh, the, the, the Kabul used to be the only city. When I used to go to Kabul in early 1970s, it was it would be Kabul was the only city. Now, now, uh, for, for example, Host, which is very close to Waziristan, Host has a university. It has uh, a cricket uh, uh, stadium, and uh, Host Airport uh, is connected with Dubai for direct international flights. So, so you see a, a, a new uh, Afghanistan, urban Afghanistan has emerged and there will be resistance. I'm, I'm very confident that there will be political resistance. We should keep on our solidarity with people's resistance. Uh, like like they, they, they came out in presence of Taliban guns, 
they came out in favor of their national uh, flag. You see, Taliban have banned everything, national flag, national anthem. Uh, and they, they want to deconstruct it. It's a demolition squad. Let loose in Afghanistan. So Afghan people will resist. So we should uh, support them. Uh, that is the second thing. Thirdly, of course, the humanitarian crisis. All these countries who are very active in promoting Taliban, imposing Taliban, creating this war, have closed their doors to refugees and IDPs, including Pakistan, Iran, and other countries, unfortunately. We should raise our voice uh, uh, against these fortress policies with service Afghan uh, refugees and displaced persons. Uh, and I think that's very important. And thirdly, we should uh, organize networking, uh, particularly in South Asian bases. We have already started that in the last three, four months. We, we, we have been holding webinars with Afghan women activists, with Afghan uh, intelligentsia, uh, like South Asians for Human Rights, Sahar uh, is an organization. Uh, I, I'm also part of that. And we, we held certain, uh, I think we should, we should expand that and we should contact Afghans activists in exile in, in the region. And we should have some sort of networking uh, for solidarity and support. Okay. Thank you. That's uh, a clear enumeration of, uh, of actions or perceptions, things to do. Uh, Ashin, what's uh, your take on that question? You were ready to answer it already. So I'm waiting to hear. Well, first of all, of course, as much pressure from progressive aspects of international civil society to insist that there be a free flow of refugees and influx. We can have a sharing between governments let everybody who wants to get out on, and seek asylum to, to be able to do so and to get the necessary support. So that is something that's very, very important and we have to put pressure for. The question of humanitarian aid and relief. Yes, but let's make a distinction with two things. One are economic sanctions. Well, first of all, as far as military pressure is concerned, absolutely no question of any kind of military pressure of any kind from outside. Mm -hmm. As far as the question of economic uh, support is concerned, economic sanctions must be opposed. Economic sanctions hurt the people of Afghanistan much, much more than they hurt the uh, uh, governing elites. Mm -hmm. So no question of economic sanctions. With regard to the question of economic help, which is different from, if you like, economic penalty, right? you have two kinds of support. One which should be utterly unconditional bring in food, bring in medicines, bring in all of that. The second aspect, which is an offer, not a, uh, a penalty, can be conditional because you have to also put pressure, pressure political, diplomatic, and cultural huh, on the government. And you can't entirely do that unless you're also prepared to put at least some kind of leverage and pressure there here. So mm -hmm. there's both unconditional and that. Mm -hmm. Third, raise awareness and the demand for maximum reparations by the United States occupying force. Of course, the United States is not going to do anything, but let us at least raise awareness about the necessity and indict it, especially in a context in which as many panelists have pointed out, they're talking about uh, using the Taliban as a justification for what they had to do and making it out to be that and letting themselves off the hook as it were. A fourth aspect, which is also very, very important, the whole global discourse on terrorism is deeply dishonest and hypocritical. When you use labels like terrorist organization, this, that, etc., you're creating a binary in which you are separating one category and then justifying whatever you do against them huh? and letting another category get off the hook. You must understand terrorism as a reference to a category of means, a technique, a tactic, a method, and not a reference to a category of persons. It is precisely because it is a reference to a category of means that you have three kinds of agencies, the individual, the groups, and states carrying out terrorist actions. The proper way to actually define these things, of course, journalistic, very convenient, is to say that these governments and these states, including democratic states, including India, including Russia, including China, including the US and others, have a history of carrying out terrorist acts and campaigns and will continue to do so, and we condemn it. So your condemnation must be universal and impartial, especially against your own governments to do that here. 
and do not fall into the trap of allowing this kind, which is very convenient journalistically, but is very, very dangerous in the sense that it lets hold people off the hook. Oh, these are people who have the guns, they are the terrorists. Look at what the United States and so many other governments have done. And all of these governments, democracy and so on. So I think at least we can try to raise awareness about this because too much of the discourse in terrorism justifies this thing. Oh, these are terrorists, but we are not terrorists. Our friends are not terrorists and so on. We have, it's very, very important to do this. And actually on this level, let me say, academia and journalism, even by the best journalists of integrity has failed. We have a long way to go to enter this thing. Actually, one quick question. Uh, the first point that you made, you, you were absolutely clear, no military pressure or intervention can be allowed. Now, the problem is that at this moment, the Taliban conquered all the military hardware that was left behind by all the departing uh, armies. So they sit on an enormous arsenal of, of military hardware. So they're, they're, for them, no more inter, uh, military intervention might even be advantageous, no? No, no. One has to be very, very clear about this. Let's understand very clearly that the single greatest democratic advance globally in the second half of the 20th century huh, was the end of colonialism. Even when this meant that the colonial ruler was replaced by brutal dictatorships. That doesn't mean you demand the end of colonialism, you continue to oppose those brutal dictatorships. And this is related to a fundamental principle of morality in international politics, which is that you have to respect the freedom of agency of a people to overthrow their own tyrant. And since we live in a world of multiple nation states where peoples are constituted as separate nations, this is required. That doesn't mean that you cannot give military aid even or other kinds of aid, mm -hmm. but you have to do that. For example, it's one thing to demand that there be an external military intervention to, to overthrow the apartheid rule. It's another one to say that we'll even give military aid to the, uh, ANC. The, uh, the, the ANC in fighting it. It's another thing to say that we will give military aid to the Indonesians to throw out the Dutch and so on. Hmm? Hmm. Even as we want freedom for the Palestinians, we're not going to demand an external military intervention. Yeah. And in this particular case, given what the United States and all the other things have done here, we support their struggle. But in even when we talk about uh, supporting struggles against this uh, terrible uh, uh, Taliban regime, we have a real problem. The other forces which have guns and are, are pretty rotten themselves. Yeah. So you, know, you have a real terrible situation. Don't add to this problem by talking about the West and the United States. Say, oh, we will get, and we are the non-terrorists and they are the usual stuff. Yeah. So I think we have to be very, very careful. It's the least bad. It's not a good thing, but it's the least bad thing that you should say. Okay, thanks for that uh, clarification. Anuradha, your take on uh, what can happen and what civil society can bring to it. Yeah, I think um, uh, I agree with what uh, Achin and uh, others have said about uh, what role uh, civil society has to play. Uh, and academics and journalists and those who uh, have consistently opposed all interventions in Afghanistan so far. And I mean, they can easily stand up and said, we told you so because civil society actors uh, across the world are the ones who, who were the ones who opposed this intervention consistently, who opposed the Taliban and exposed them consistently. So they are the ones on the high moral ground and they have to continue to to be that. So for that, of course, they have to number one support, as everyone said, uh, the, the displaced, the refugees, the humanitarian crisis, continuously it can't be a one off. And then there's something new, just like we've forgotten about Myanmar. Now it's Afghanistan, tomorrow it's something else. This has to be consistent and we have to keep pre putting pressure on it. Uh, second, we have to oppose all military interventions and economic sanctions. And we have to also use the rhetoric trap. All these countries around who played a role all these years have said, are saying now, they're saying today, whether it's the US or whether it's Russia, they're telling the Taliban, they're telling, they told the earlier government that you should have an inclusive government. And China is saying that, India is saying that you should have an inclusive government, have power sharing. But are they doing inclusive geopolitics themselves? If Russia, China, the US, the EU, uh, Iran, 
Iraq, India sat together, uh, they would resolve this issue, uh, taking these issues, but they themselves are only pushing their own agendas versus the others. So we use, you know, civil society has the moral ground of using this rhetoric trap on this kind of geostrategic uh, approach and deconstructing the kind of uh, imperial knowledge and uh, narratives which have been uh, going on. And also very important to give voice to um, the Afghan people and support the Afghan people's resistance, uh, which uh, will, will come uh, in, the, in the coming days. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. And then uh, Curry, let's wrap up this round uh, with your perspective. Thank you. Yeah. So first of all, again, I want to reiterate the, the need to um, civil society not only to demand a welcome of, of refugees, uh, Afghan refugees, but actually this should be occasion to completely, um, at least speaking for the U.S., but I don't think just the U.S., to, to actually rethink entirely the whole approach to refugees. Uh, you know, there are many people around the world who try to migrate to the United States, and for the most part, that is, um, that's done, uh, what, in this kind of marginalized way. We don't hear about the process for what it actually takes to come here. And what we've seen in the U.S. media in the past couple of weeks is a revelation, the fact that uh, this, this special visa that the U.S. finally created for Afghan people who worked with, um, you know, the U.S. in some capacity, that there are 15, there's a 15 step process that there are people who've applied it, applied for this many years ago uh, and so on. And the, the entire thing <laughs> needs to be dismantled and rethought because it is so out of step with the actual need uh, for refugees. Once again, that is true for people in Afghanistan who have been displaced and who are fleeing, but also for the many millions of people who have been displaced by the war on terror. So, you know, we need to demand solidarity with refugees right now and to open the borders and so on uh, as part of a bigger conversation about rethinking refugee migration in general, because the, the, the war on terror, which, you know, uh, in so many ways has been centered in Afghanistan, has displaced so many people. Um, then I think about the question of demilitarization. We've been talking uh, in, this, in this whole session uh, about how, certainly when we think about the US's history with, with uh, Afghanistan, we're talking about the past two decades of militarization or going back to four decades uh, of militarization. And I invite us to consider what would 20 years of demilitarization look like? Uh, what would 40 years of demilitarization look like? What would it look like to actually dismantle the systems that have been developed to militarize Afghanistan? And so for us located in the US, of course, that means confronting uh, the government and you know, ending the military operations, ending the CIA operations, uh, the military aid and so on, that is stopping the harm. But it's also about a different kind of commitment to the Afghan people. And one of those, I, I want to second what Achen said about reparations. The United States owes reparations to Afghanistan. This is not a question of US aid in the, in the sense of helping Afghanistan, but rather there was uh, damage, there was a harm done that has to be repaired in a, in, in a way that should be directed by Afghan people themselves. Now, this in, in some ways, of course, as, as, as Achen said, there's a real challenge in, in, in you know, fighting for this kind of thing and winning it. But on the other hand, the money is certainly there. Actually, um, at the moment, there's $6 billion were slated for the Afghan military and US military aid to flow to the Afghan military just in this year, right? They weren't anticipating the collapse of that military. And so this six, there's, there's a pipeline with $6 billion already meant to flow through it. That, those kind of funds should be redirected um, to reparations, <clears throat> excuse me, for Afghan people in ways that they demand. Similarly, uh, the, the National Priorities Project, which is uh, part of the, the think tank, the Institute for Policy Studies, where I work, uh, did a study that found that in 2020, the year 2020, uh, the Pentagon spent $18.6 billion on its operations in Afghanistan. And that, that same amount of money could be used to <clears throat> welcome 1.2 million refugees to the United States. So the funds exist, but they are channeled in the form of militarization. And when we think about how to rechannel that, I think that reparations actually should be the key kind of framework. The last thing I think is for those of us in civil society to ask ourselves, what are our relations with the Afghan people? What do relations of solidarity look like? Because, you know, again, 
somebody located in this place called the United States, we are bound in a relationship with the people of Afghanistan. It is a catastrophic relationship at the moment that's mediated by our horrendous government. But I ask us to think, what would it look like to have relations that are independent of the government, but with Afghan people? And that includes, of course, people in the Afghan diaspora, which tragically is a, is a growing diaspora, um, and people in Afghanistan itself. There are people right now, Afghans, who are fighting for the direction of their society. I think, for example, about institutions of higher, uh, of, of academia, uh, and the various relations that American universities have with other universities around the world. What would it look like to demand that our institutions ha build relations with Afghan academics and others who are fighting um, or, or who, are, who are cultivating uh, uh, a kind of progressive vision for, for or, and, and just different visions, better visions for Afghan society. So that kind of commitment, I think we have to ask ourselves uh, to, to make. And I think it really, at the end of the day, it rests on, you know, this notion of the fact that Afghan people have the capacity to imagine and create a better future. You know, Achin was talking about the uh, importance of the end of colonialism and how even when colonialism ends, what comes next may be, may be messy. And certainly things will be messy in Afghanistan for a long time. But the fact is that Afghan people in Afghanistan and Afghan people who are currently fleeing have visions of what Afghanistan could look like. And I think we have to build relationships with folks uh, and think about what it means to support Afghans as they, as they pursue those visions. Okay, thanks. Let me throw in one uh, little detail maybe uh, that has not been uh, focal in our discussion, but I think if we move forward and if we try to uh, develop relationship with, uh, with visions uh, from Afghanistan, I think the importance of, uh, of farmers, uh, both men and women of uh, rural people is so crucial and it has been forgotten for 20 years. Uh, 60 to 70% of Afghans lived in the rural area 20 years ago hardly anything, not even 5% of all the development funds that went to Afghanistan ended up in the rural area, let alone the billions and trillions that were spent and that was just going to military or to the larger security environment that had to be created uh, around the interventionist uh, forces. So anyway, for me, it's been always a, a point of, uh, of attention. If we talk about Afghanistan, we're too often forgetting that a majority of the people are farmers or live in and off the land and, and in the rural area. Okay, thank you very much for all these insights and uh, a lot of ideas that, that need discussion that are not final, uh, but that bring a lot of, uh, of conversation and, and we've seen it happening at the bottom of the screen, people participating in, in their own way. If we didn't respond or if I didn't respond, that's because it's impossible to, to do three things at the same time, at least for a male like me. I know that women are better at multifunctioning, but uh, I couldn't do that. But somebody uh, from uh, TNI or uh, AEPF has been following the questions. So I would like to ask them to come up somehow and, uh, and, and try to bring at least one or two, three questions that have been posted in the Q&A box. And uh, then we'll see who in the panel would like to react to that. Um, is there anybody? Uh, okay, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. I'm here, yes. I'm here, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, there has been a lot of comments, a uh, lively discussion in the, in the chat box and also some questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, I think one that is um, interesting is also on the, let's say, uh, the ISIS threat, uh, the, yeah. where does it actually uh, is situated? Um, and there are, many other similar factions uh, in the in the region um it uh, somebody remarked that uh, it might be like a, a bit used also in the media to make the taliban uh, look more as a moderate uh, faction uh, so uh, that uh, that was one interesting remark 
of the many uh, interesting remarks. Um, I think also the role of Pakistan uh, was uh, highlighted. Um, I mean, as long as, let's say, uh, the situation or context in Pakistan will not change, uh, it will be very hard to build up uh, Afghanistan. Um, and I think also what you mentioned, uh, like uh, the rural area, um, how is the situation in the, say, outside the cities? Um, is there any idea of what the situation looks like? Uh, how are people there uh, reacting to this uh, dramatic change of, uh, say, the regime? So okay. that's a bit three questions that I can already uh, put in here. Okay, thank you, Chris, for uh, for doing that. First question, quick uh, clarifications. Uh, IS Khorasan or Daesh Khorasan province uh, has been in the news, uh, of course, after the attack that they did on uh, on the airport a couple of days ago. But uh, is it is it a maneuver? Is it real? Is it a danger? Um, I asked somebody in Kabul uh, just two days ago whether there was an, an a danger that if the Taliban would move a bit to the center, that some of their militants would move over to Daesh. He said no, because Daesh doesn't belong to the Hanafi uh, uh, stream of, uh, of Islam, as the, the Taliban clearly do. So there is no, no leakage to Daesh. But Anybody who wants to add an insight, I won't take all five of you on each question. So is there anybody that wants to comment? Achin, I see you want to. Yeah, I, I would love to. Achin, yeah, please. 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 Afrisha, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I, I don't agree with the, the, you, your friend from Kabul who, when he told you that they have a different uh, jurisprudence, Islamic jurisprudence. You see, Osama bin Laden was a Humbleite, Imam Humble. He believed in the mm. jurisprudence of Imam Humble. But you see, he uh, Taliban who were uh, Hanafis, very closely united politically. So political Islam overcomes these jurisprudence. Jurisprudential uh, differences. So, so let's be very clear about that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I want to say that ICE is real threat, but it is not some something that has come from the Middle East. It is the, in the continuation of the militancy of uh, Mujahideen, Taliban, and IS. IS is a new addition. I agree with the analysis that it will look Taliban moderate. Now, 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 it, they, they will be the Taliban will become good Taliban, and ICE will be bad Taliban. You see, it has been happening during all these uh, 40 years. We have seen good Taliban. So it's it's bad Taliban, and they will be doing things, dirty things. Uh, but but uh, I mean, they most, I, I know most, because they're in eastern Afghanistan, very close to us, yeah. uh, not far away from Peshawar. And their supply lines is the same, the old line that was always from Mujahideen for Taliban. Now the same supply line is supplying them. So, so you see, they, they, they are sort of... Uh, 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 they will attack Shias, for example. They, they will. Uh, they will tomorrow. Eastern Turkestan Islamic movement. If they move, Taliban would say, "Oh, we are not doing it. We are, we are acting against them." But but what, what can we do? Is, Daesh is doing it. So they, it is a dirty uh, tricks brigade, uh, which is taking over uh, its duty in this new Cold War in Afghanistan. And Russians are mighty uh, sort of concerned. As far as I know about from the media, I mean, they, they say uh, the West has brought uh, this IS to, to hit them. I, I, I don't know that the West, has, but, but it, is, it, it is a new outfit for, yeah. to carry on militancy, to, to uh, weaponize Islam, and to create Islamophobia I mean, at the same time. Yeah. Anybody else, Achin, you want to add to that? Yeah, just uh, very quickly, I just add to that that. Um, the difference between uh, forces like ISIS is so far have been is that they seek to uh, establish a kind of broader Islamic caliphate and export the radical Islam. Yeah. The thing about Taliban so far is that it has really been much more a form of Afghan nationalism involved in Pakistan, of course, the Pashtun uh, question over here, but has not been so far the kind of force that carries out um, uh, attacks uh, uh, elsewhere. It's, yeah. It's much more there. And I think this is uh, an important factor. But of course, 
all kinds of forces carry out their yeah. terrorist attacks. That's it. Okay. Anybody else want? Uh, I would yeah. like to add uh, something. I agree with uh, Afrasia Khatek uh, uh, that uh, the Taliban, of course, there are, they seem to be united, and this is one Taliban we hear this one movement, but definitely there are different uh, uh, groups within the Taliban with different interests and uh, different power uh, interests. Everyone wants power drug war and everything. So there are possibilities that, you know, uh, uh, a number of Taliban joined the uh, ISIS. And uh, I also fear that it's a uh, danger to Afghanistan, uh, to its people again, uh, whether it's a deal, whether it's a new project by the countries in the region, the United States is a different thing to be yeah. seen and to be uh, analyzed. But uh, it is also because of the fact that Afghanistan is this humanitarian crisis, this poverty, this lack of jobs, this what you also talked about. You know, Afghanistan is not just Kabul or few other cities. It's beyond that. And what's happening in the rural areas. So it will definitely make people, force people somehow, you know, to to go to some sort of uh, these groups, as was the case with the Taliban. So this this is really a matter of concern, and also uh, it, it will be very dangerous for Afghanistan. Yeah. Let's maybe jump to the second question that Chris uh, took from, uh, from all the audience, uh, which is the role of Pakistan and, and I know that we could make a real long separate session on, on the question of uh, why and how and in how far uh, Pakistan and especially then ISI has been uh, part of this uh, Afghan project or Taliban project. But maybe uh, a few quick reactions of the panel on, on the question, is Pakistan a crucial player for the future. I mean, maybe we leave a little bit the, the past, but if we look at uh, at August 2021 forward, will Pakistan decide what will happen in Afghanistan? Let me phrase it that way as a challenge. Afrishap, I'm sure that you have ideas about that. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll very briefly say, I believe uh, Pakistani generals are obsessed with uh, turning Afghanistan in, into an appendage of Pakistan. They are very obsessed and they're very fixated and they're very determined. When it comes to foreign players in Afghanistan, ISI has been the most determined player. And I believe they will keep on uh, uh, doing it. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, 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 Personally, I am very much against this policy because I think it's suicidal for Pakistan. And, it and has, is it is it because are they driven mostly by the conflict with India, the, the fear that they will have to be sandwiched between two enemies, or is it mainly Pashto nationalism that makes them nervous? There are three things. In, in India, yes, in the background, yeah, there's one factor. Other is Pashtun question, you're absolutely right. Pashtun question, because there are 50 million plus Pashtuns in Pakistan. I mean, Pashtun nationalism yeah. uh, can, can really, they're scared of that. Thirdly, it's a big army. We, 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 the country shrunk in 1971. It's like uh, in, in Mr. Bhutto, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, in his last book that he wrote in Death Cell in Rawalpindi Jail uh, before being executed, he said, it's like Prussia. Prussians had a big army for Napoleonic wars. Once were those wars were over, they didn't know what, what to do. Yeah. He says the they, they expansion was the first option, which Bismarck adopted in 1871. The second option was to reduce the strength of the army. The third was to keep the status quo and let the country crumble under the burden of a big army. Bhutto writes that actually Pakistan can't have these first two options, expansion and the second reduction in the army. So he, he, he concludes that we are condemned to have the third option, keeping the status quo, the big army, and letting the country crumble. But the military thinks differently. They think expansion is possible. And the strategic depth is basically expansion. Yeah. Anybody else wants to add a perspective to that question? I don't know, Anuradha? 
I, I agree with uh, Afra Saab Khattar because whatever I've read, whatever I keep reading about uh, statements from Pakistan, there's this constant talk of strategic debt. It's been there since the 1970s. Uh, and uh, they're very serious about it. And this AFPAC, which came at one time and then it was delinked, it's back in the discourse that yeah. there has to be some kind of AFPAC. Uh, yeah. And that is why uh, the Durand line is not really taken seriously. I mean, 25,000 Afghans have been crossing that every day since uh, this collapse. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and Pakistan feels that uh, they have had the burden of these uh, uh, refugees. So actually they are owed reparations that they should be given all the assistance. Um, and uh, so I, I think they're going to leverage this uh, for the next milk it for the next uh, 20 years with China, with Russia. Uh, you know, you can see in this pattern, which I talked about every when the Russians went, it was a victory for Pakistan. When the Afghans have gone, even their prime minister has said it's a victory. So both times there has been one constant victor and that's Pakistan. So the uh, uh, Pakistan army does see this as a victory which, which they require. Yeah. Okay, first question that, uh, that Chris. I, I would oh, like just yes, to please. add, yeah, Sorry. sorry. Uh, actually two things. Uh, one is that, uh, okay, uh, as you said, we don't talk about the history and the brutal involvement of Pakistan in Afghanistan. When Afghans will remember, General Hamid uh, Akhtar's uh, statement that Kabul must be burnt. This is what uh, uh, was the idea in Pakistan and it happened. But the question is also, unfortunately, that the people in Pakistan, and now the majority of them, uh, really either don't understand the, the brutal consequences of what happened in Afghanistan on, on Pakistan and its people. Uh, so we see that how this uh, huge hatred between the two countries, and by that I don't mean the army or the governments, I mean the people. Uh, so, and this is really painful. This, uh, this has to be changed. This, the, I especially uh, would like the people in Pakistan through the progressive organizations and people to uh, really understand uh, how important it is the, the solidarity, the, to establish solidarity between the two countries, because we together can fight this uh, uh, disaster, this uh, uh, criminal authority. So this is really, I mean, I, I personally who lived in Pakistan for many, many years. So it's, it, it's quite painful to see how they don't understand that what happened, we see what happened in the tribal areas and even in other places, how the extremism did, what did uh, to Pakistan, but even in the future, but it will not stop is uh, mentioned by others. A final question, and then I'm afraid we're, uh, we will be at uh, two hours, so we will be uh, folding up. But one question is uh, the, the question of, of the rural area, uh, the, the people that are beyond the cameras uh, that have been uh, cut off from whatever uh, funds that have come into Afghanistan the past uh, decades. <clears throat> I, would, I would want to put it a, a difficult question because a lot of the people in rural Afghanistan would not agree with the policies that progressive movements want to put forward. Can progressive movements work with conservative Afghans in the rural area? How, how do we imagine that? Because if we, if we can't, then we have a problem, I think. And, but my, my challenge is, how do we, how do we imagine that? Well, uh, I don't agree with that. I mean, uh, it is a, a very wrong image. I understand you don't, but in order to challenge this, uh, this is uh, the majority of Afghan people have nothing to oppose uh, those progressive ideas or progressive human rights or democracy or freedom. 
So majority of people want to uh, their children get educated. I give you personal uh, experiences and examples. My family comes from a very remote uh, uh, areas, um, rural area in northern Afghanistan. But there, people at any cost are ready to send their daughters to school. Mm -hmm. They walk five, six kilometers, take their daughters to school. Uh, uh, to so because they understand the importance of education, because they understand that this is the way to uh, have a dignified life. This is the way to have peace. This is the way to rebuild the country. People are working day and night. It's not just in Kabul, which, you know, uh, people start at four in the morning to go to university. Maybe we cannot find any other city in the world where students went to university or any kind of course or educational institute four in the morning and, and uh, finished at 10 or uh, uh, 11 at night. My own father at 60, when he got opportunity to get education, higher education, after job, he went to uh, a higher education institute to get higher education. So uh, there are many, many such examples. And Afghanistan is part of this world. It's not just, you know, uh, in Mars or in some other alien coming from uh, alien planet. People want peace, people want freedom, people want education, people want rights for their children, for the women, they want job. They want all uh, human rights and dignified life like us, like many others in the world. So this is not uh, uh, the right uh, image. And even a survey by, I don't know what, some organization showed that there's a very little support among Pashtuns, let's say, for the Taliban. But on the same time, when Talib comes to you with a gunpoint and ask for food, ask for bread, ask for protection, what should you do? You don't have any option. And this is what uh, has happened uh, in most of the rural areas. But uh, of course, I mean, as you rightly said, the rural areas are forgotten in that very big district. There are hardly few schools that also uh, established or supported by the local people or those privately who uh, could help. So there is nothing really, and this was also the reason because they, those rural areas didn't get any help, any development in the last 20 years. So it also resulted in the failure of, of the government and all uh, what we see today. Okay, that was clear. Achin, you want to come in on that? Yeah, just uh, just uh, two points. One is that um, uh, you have, if you like, three kinds of nationalisms or, or loyalties in, in, in Afghanistan. One is, of course, well known that sort of overlay of uh, Afghan nationalism. You also have very particular loyalties of various kinds to chiefs, to groups, and so on. And then you have a kind of modernizing nationalism, if you like. And a younger generation, which as Sabah has said very correctly, is aspiring towards modernization. And the weight of this section has grown relative to others. However, Afghanistan is something like Saudi Arabia and not like Turkey or Indonesia. Muslim majority countries, but Saudi Arabia and, and Afghanistan are still in some ways tribal countries, tribal societies, sorry, tribal societies, unlike Indonesia and elsewhere. So this is a significant factor. You do have this growing weight. And then the second point is one has to learn the lessons of the failure of the attempts at uh, uh, progressive reforms in agrarian uh, Afghanistan by the PDPA. And rather made a very, very important point. And that is that if you are going to try to eliminate the uh, uh, opium trade and all that, you have to provide support and employment to those who have to rely on this here. And that cannot come only from agriculture or to only a limited extent from agriculture. It will have to come from actually providing opportunities in terms of other aspects of the economy. Within the uh, uh, agrarian society, if you're going to carry out land reforms uh, and cancellation of debts, which is what the PDPA tried to do, please understand that what you have to do first is to establish a whole infrastructure of credit, of support, 
marketing of seeds, fertilizers, of all of these things so that it becomes feasible. And all this also depends finally on also altering the political relationship of forces in Afghanistan. So it's a very long-term thing, but I think it's something that a signpost of where we can head. And let's hope that one can move in that direction. Okay, I'll wrap it up yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, because it's uh, we've we've been going for for two hours and and I'm sure that uh, there's many uh, things that that need to be said, many questions that uh, that need answers. But today was just bringing together bright minds and a large global audience to think through the Afghan crisis in a different perspective than what we are presented with by our governments, our mainstream media, and certainly by our militaries. I would like, in the name of the organizers, thank Sahar Saba, Kori Peterson-Smith, Anuradha Chinoy, Afrasyab Katak, and Achim Van Eyck uh, for bringing their best ideas, their bright insights, and their very close uh, engagement with the situation in Afghanistan and with Afghans to this uh, conversation so that we all leave the room, the virtual room, uh, more enlightened than what, uh, what, how we came. So thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Thank you very much uh, for bringing your ideas and uh, hope that, uh, that this will not be the last time that we talk to each other and that we motivate each other to not let Afghanistan slip away, but to help to stand with the Afghans and help them formulate, build their own future, because that is what they deserve without military intervention from whatever power. Thank you. Thank you. So nice of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Very much. Very good job. Thanks. Thank you. It's fantastic. Yeah. Very interesting. Thanks. It was my yeah. pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Bye.